Wonderful. <laughs> that that was one of the words I used. <laughs> Fill in the blank. Yeah. Gosh was another. Okay, everyone, welcome. Welcome to our third annual tree summit. Um, can you see my face and not my screen? Oops. Can you see my face now? Now I do. Okay, great. Yay. Thank you all for being here. Um, I'd like to introduce Betsy Wasco to start us off. Okay. Uh, uh, thank you, Allie. Uh, good morning, friends and neighbors. Yeah, welcome to for us to talk. We should be able. Uh, welcome to this. Oh, could you please mute? Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, be sure everyone's muted, please. I'm. I apologize. Um, welcome to the third annual Tree Summit. Uh, thank you for being here. We are here to celebrate trees, the cornerstone of our ecological well-being and biodiversity. We are here to learn about interrelated. What are these things up here? I can't read them. Remove uh, pen. Uh, we are here to learn about interrelationships between people, flora, and fauna. While we will have a science-based presentation, our environmental issues are not only or even primarily scientific, but moral and ethical as well. Solving environmental issues, including those concerning trees, will therefore require a systematic and comprehensive approach involving not only science and technology, but ethics, commerce, religious institutions, personal responsibility, schools, law, and government. With interrelationships in mind, with expansiveness and receptivity in mind, with resilience, responsibility, and healing in mind. Please allow me to begin our summit with the following words from Kim Stafford, former Oregon yeah. Poet Laureate. From Stafford's collection, Earthverse, it is entitled Abe and I. I asked Abe's help for war against earth, and this is what he said. Four score and seven years from now, our descendants may inherit this earth, on this earth, an older story conceived in diversity and dedicated to the recognition that all creatures live as one. Now we are engaged in a great struggle, testing whether this creation, so conceived and so blessed, can long endure. We are met in a great community for that struggle. We have come to dedicate a portion of our grief as a final resting place for those creatures who lost their glory, departing this creation. It is fitting and proper that we should do this. In a larger sense, we cannot dedicate, we cannot consecrate, and we cannot hallow this creation. The desperate creatures, local ways of being, vibrant cultures, and neglected children, living and dead, who struggled here, have consecrated it, far above our poor power to sing or mourn. The whole earth will little note nor long remember what we say here, but it can never forget what we now choose to do. It is for us the living rather to be dedicated to the unfinished work which they who struggled and lost here have thus far so painfully clarified. It is rather for us to be here dedicated to the great task remaining before us, that from these tattered beauties, we take increased devotion to that cause for which they lost their last full measure of living witness and of song, that we here highly resolve that these lost ones shall not be joined by an endless parade of others, long in splendor, suddenly gone, that this great mother earth shall have a new birth and welcome to her own in that reconciliation of all creatures, by all creatures, for all creatures, shall not perish from the earth. Amen, Mr. Stafford. And now, please welcome Allie Mullen, Oswego Lake Watershed Council Education and Outreach Coordinator. Hey there, can you hear me okay? Um, okay, um, as, uh, thank you for that intro, Betsy. Um, as she said, I am the Community Outreach Specialist for Oswego Lake Watershed Council. Um, 
Jack, thank you for sharing my screen. I'm just gonna pause a second for. Awesome, cool. Can everyone see the slideshow? Cool. Yes. All right. Um, um, so before I get started on this quick community recap, I just wanna thank Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District for providing the grant funding to make this event possible. Um, I have a lot to talk about, but if I'm speaking too quickly, please let me know. Um, Jack, you can go to the next slide and the next one. So our soil is an often unappreciated aspect of the urban forest and it doesn't get a ton of attention and education. So uh, this year our watershed council adopted the Sol Soil Your Undies project as a way of exploring and demonstrating how soil is absolutely fundamental to life on earth and an important indicator of health of our urban forests. Um, and as part of Earth Day, we handed out 103 plain white cotton briefs to families in the community. And those undies were then buried in yards and gardens across Lake Oswego. Um, and then three months later, the participants dug up their briefs and over 30 families brought what was left of their undies to our Reveal Your Undies event on July 7th. Um, and if you'd like to learn more about the results of that project, I'd encourage you to visit our website. Um, you can definitely see from the bottom right photo that there was a variety of decomposed undies on the laundry line. Um, but yes, we hope to do this campaign annually to build more of a complete understanding of the soil health in Lake Oswego. Uh, next slide, Jack. So our urban forest committees were started as a way for Lake Oswego residents to feel like they have more agency and voice in the decisions that are made regarding their natural areas and as a way to get neighborhoods more connected and involved. Um, we are still in the beginning stages, but we had an excellent revival meeting in September attended uh, by representatives from 10 neighborhood associations. And at these meetings, we discussed community steward projects and education. Um, and we are in the process of planning some really fun volunteer events for No Ivy Day next month, as well as Arbor Day events for next year. Uh, next slide, Jack. So we all want to see actual results come from these summits and discussions. I think Elo Tree is a perfect example of an urban forestry initiative that has the potential to contribute really informative data about the urban forest. Um, it's a tree inventory survey anyone in Lake Oswego can use on their phone to measure urban trees and contribute to a long-term data set. Uh, the hope is that the data can be used to help the city articulate the environmental and economic benefits of the urban forests, um, which should help with forestry management decisions. Um, this year, we had a few really productive trainings. The most recent was spent with five volunteers and provided a lot of helpful feedback on the survey. Um, a very special thanks to Morgan Holland for her willingness to bring her indispensable arborist knowledge to the LO Tree trainings and um, providing technical support for the survey itself. Um, I'm looking forward to working with Morgan Moore to provide more workshops so we can get this survey off the ground and start collecting that data. Um, this is all a volunteered power citizen science project, so please let me know if you're curious and would like a demo of the survey. Um, next slide, Jack. So here are some type two permit wins since the 2020 tree summit. Uh, one important win is that um, there is communication from developers and homeowners who are willing to discuss tree removals before submitting applications, which is a super important step forward for a uh, more collaborative discussion in our community. Um, there are a lot of unsung heroes working on this monitoring and commenting of the application. So if you'd like more info, you can email the address on the slide. The green teams are uh, such an integral part of our urban forest and they're doing a lot of good innovative work. Um, one perk of my job is that occasionally I get to do restoration with work with them on their campus. Um, the LOHS green team has been working hard to make improvements in their environment and community, uh, both on and off campuses. Their main focus is the school yard activism, gardens and grounds, renewable energy, elementary and middle school outreach and curriculum. They've been holding consistent ivy pole events, removing invasive species from their campus uh, with plans to plant native species in their place in order to prevent soil erosion. 
Um, and the goal of this year is to remove all the ivy from the large stretch of land by the baseball field. Um, they're also currently working on getting recertified as an Oregon Green School. And Lake Ridge is also hard at work on their campus reviewing curriculum to ensure that all students are getting proper information about climate change. Um, in September, they participated in the Youth Climate Town Hall featuring Rob Wyden. Next slide, Jack, thanks. So the Watershed Council has been working to restore 17 acres of Oregon white oak habitat. With volunteer help, we've been removing invasive species, planting and seeding in oak woodland, riparian and wetland habitat. Uh, volunteer stewardship, environmental education, and community science monitoring um, is some main goals of this project. Um, we're working with arborists to improve structure and regeneration through selective removal of ash trees. And um, we just want to thank the city of Lake Oswego, Clackamas Soil and Water Conservation District, and Westlake HOA for funding this project. Uh, next slide, Jack. We are super excited to have some city planning representatives here at the summit, and we're very much looking forward to the city tree canopy presentation um, later in the event. Um, thank you so much for being a part of that. Next slide. And then the Watershed Council is excited to be working with homeowner associations on securing funding for habitat enhancement and stormwater projects on common property. Uh, that's been a really important devel development this year. Um, next slide. And finally, um, Oswego Lake Watershed Council and LOSN are both nonprofit organizations that rely on support from community members to do our stewardship and education work. Um, and as we enter the holiday season, we'd really appreciate you considering making a donation to fund our work. Um, you can donate using links on our website um, and we'll also drop some links in the chat as well. Um, so uh, the, the event structure this year will be similar to last year's. Uh, next slide, sorry, Jack. Um, in that there will be three breakout discussions um, but because we have so much information we want to share we don't want we don't have time for whole group share outs for each one so i encourage you to utilize the event chat um, and have your discussion leaders post your ideas which will then collect post recording and share out um, so just some zoom etiquette stuff please stay on mute during active presentations um, and the tree summit is meant to be an educational event so please keep your discussions centered on breakout questions and the overall theme of the summit um, and please keep your responses brief um, a few sentences so that everyone has a chance to participate. Uh, next slide. So um, the breakout we're gonna right after I'm done, I think this is the last slide. So um, we're gonna break out into our first discussion. Um, each group will assign one person to take notes, keep time and share the group's ideas. Um, and then no whole group share out for this discussion. Um, but if the note taker can list the discussion responses in the event main chat bar, um, again, please limit to one or two sentences. And the questions are describe a special tree in your life and discuss the impacts of recent weather events, um, such as the ice storms and heat domes. Um, and yes, we will reconvene in five or uh, 10 minutes and um, then our keynote speaker will be next. Everyone, go ahead and uh, post in the chat your ideas as we are reconvening. I hope you had some inspiring and productive discussions. All right, so I just want to introduce our keynote speaker, uh, Dr. Christine Buell. Um, Christine, just for time purposes, I'm gonna let you give your own intro, but um, I just wanna say that Christine is a total rock star and we're super, super lucky to have her. Um, she's doing amazing work in her field. Um, yeah, um, so Christine, go ahead and take it away. I'll stop sharing. Okay, can you see my slides? Yeah. 
Yes, we can. Great. Okay, I'll go ahead and get started. So um, I'm Christine Buell um, from Oregon Department of Forestry. I'm the state forest entomologist, and I want to thank you so much for having me as a resident of Southwest Portland. Lake Oswego is a place that I frequent, and I have a personal interest in seeing thrive ecologically. Um, today, I'm going to be covering a diversity of topics that I see as pressing for your community. So hang in there with me. Um, it's going to be a, a bit of a wild ride. We're going to span a lot of different topics in the urban and wildland um, forest interface areas. So we're really lucky in this part of the state and in this part of the country in the Pacific Northwest to have forest fragments that are still interwoven into our cityscapes. And we're also really lucky to have so many towns participating in things such as the Tree City USA and other program efforts because they really do incorporate green spaces and trees into our daily surroundings. And so I've listed here some importance of forest remnants, especially in our urban areas that many of you are aware of, um, but some maybe you're not thinking about of all the benefits that they actually do provide. And I do have citations um, down below that you can read up more about um, each one of these topics and how they've actually done research to see the positive benefit of these forest fragments. Um, most obviously, they are islands of diversity. They're just a little different from the urban environment. And so having that different soil type or plant component can be very beneficial to local species or adjacent species that are moving through the area. Um, and they are great wildlife corridors. So having these little pockets, um, very important because there are a lot of different types of uh, wildlife that we're not thinking about that maybe even at night that are traveling through the area and they really rely on um, those forest remnants. Owls are a big a component of that. They are cooling sources in heat islands. So cities are notoriously um, warmer than their surrounding areas. A lot of that is just due to the substrate that they're built on. So having concrete and pavement surfaces um, actually heat up that local area. So having spots of shaded areas um, and soil um, bearing areas are actually really beneficial to bringing down that overall temperature. Forest fragments are also phytoremediation substrates and this also includes street trees. So having these trees present to clean the soil, water and air is really beneficial. And as I think we're mostly aware, the recreation and mental health outlets that these areas provide, even seeing a single tree on a street versus no trees at all can really improve um, mental health. Um, you know, it's a relaxing sight to see, even if you're not a really outdoorsy person, there's great benefit there. And tourism attractions is a big piece. Um, a lot of people come to the Pacific Northwest and Oregon in particular because of the beauty here. And we do have a lot of forested area, even in our cities that are very attractive for visitors. And there's a strong correlation with decreased crime rates and increased home values wherever we retain uh, trees on our landscape. But to retain these green spaces, we really have to pay attention to city codes, especially when they're at risk of changing. So I really, um, I, I always mention to people that they should take a look at what their current city codes are. Sometimes it's complicated and hard to wade through all the legalese, but looking at your city codes, especially when there is a move to change them is very important because those small changes in city codes apply broadly on the landscape and they can greatly reduce the tree component on our landscape. Um, it's very rare to um, have an area that's been developed where the forest has already been removed and to send it back to forest. So we need to think preventatively, thinking about retaining as much of these wild spaces as we can. Some of the really important pieces of city codes that we need to pay attention to and ensure are retained are that there are permitting or replacement requirements for removal of trees above a certain size. So that DBH is that diameter of the tree. If you're removing especially larger trees that have been there for a long time, there should be a permitting requirement or a replacement requirement. You can't just um, remove those larger trees because they've been there for a long time and replacing them is with a smaller tree that's not going to get to that diameter um, is not beneficial. Um, there should also be a prohibition on removal of trees in ecologically sensitive zones. I'm thinking of like riparian buffers, for example. Um, in long waterways. <clears throat> and then also, this is more of a, a rare inclusion of city codes that I think should be um, increased and, and you should look at your current codes and That's see where you're standing. 
um, there should be a native or coniferous species replacement. So in the Pacific Northwest, we are broadly coniferous. And so a lot of times what happens is for building structures, those conifers are removed and then they're replaced with maybe ornamental broadleaves. And that really changes what our cityscape looks like and the benefits on that site. It's changing what that tree is providing. And so really requiring that when trees are removed, there's a replacement of a similar species or something that's adapted that to go back into that spot is very important. There should also be um, restrictions for topping or extensive crown removal. A lot of topping is done, especially under power lines, um, and that's often not beneficial and those trees are slated to die in the subsequent years and it would actually be better to remove them and put in a tree that's more fitting in that area rather than continuously topping that tree. Um, there should be specialist review and approval of tree removals due to hazard or infestation of insects, uh, diseases, or other tree mortality factors to ensure that those trees really are dying or struggling rather than they're just going through a rough patch, but they'll come back around. Um, it's very easy for an arborist, for example, to look at a tree and go, well, it's turning a little red. It's probably dead. Let's just take it out now when really that tree has a chance. So it's really important to have a specialist do a thorough review to ensure if that tree can stay, in the, stay where it stands. And I will point you to a really nice guidance document that I saw on the Lake Oswego website, Right Tree, Right Place Guide. So when you are thinking about tree removal, it's very important to think about, well, what could go there next? Often you'll have a replant requirement anyway. And so you'll want to choose the tree that will have the best chance of success. You want to put the right species in the right place that will be climate change adapted um, for that spot. Otherwise, you might be looking at a replacement in um, sooner than you were planning because that tree is just not the right species for that spot. So I'm going to jump over to wildfire a little bit. So in terms of preservation of what we have, wildfire seasons have become increasingly virulent in recent years in the West, as we are all aware. Now, wildfire is a natural component of our forest ecosystems, and when it's allowed to run its natural cycle, we want wildfire on our landscape. But there are unnatural circumstances in which it can scar our forests beyond repair and including our city forests, um, particularly in the wildland urban interface. Sometimes you'll hear that called the wooey. Um, wildfire and smoke are literally approaching our doorsteps as we have been aware in recent years. And I encourage you to think about this in terms of ensuring that your homes are safe by following some simple tips, um, such as removing dead needles in the summer from your gutters, because if there's a nearby fire, it can spot over and, and a, a flame can land on your gutters and light up your gutters and there goes the house, even if you have defensible space or area, a buffer area around your home that does not have any vegetation that could possibly catch on fire. If you have it in your gutters, it can still catch on fire. So I would look at um, starting with the Keep Oregon Green web website. That is actually a division of my agency, Oregon Department of Forestry. And there are a lot of useful tips there. So it's always something to keep in the back of your mind. Even though you're not in a wildland area, um, we're still at risk of wildfire in our urban areas. So what this map is showing you um, is a highlight of a few of our major fires in history to give you a relative idea of what's happening out there. And this is just a few fires over a long span of time. So historically, we have had fires just as large as we're seeing now, such as the 355,000 acre Tillamook complex of the 1930s that took out a large tract of our forest that was replanted in what we now know as the Tillamook State Forest. But that was dwarfed just this year by the bootleg fire at 414,000 acres. That is a large area that was burned in a very short period of time relative to the Tillamook complex. The Tillamook complex went on to burn for over a year, whereas the bootleg took um, just a couple of months to catch that large area on fire. So that's really scary because we have had large fires in the past, but have they happened as quickly? No. So this is something we are very concerned about. And I also want you to think about um, the relationship in sizes, because oftentimes we are not thinking about how large these fires are, um, how large these fires are. And so if you remember a few years back in 2017, the Eagle Creek fire in the gorge that sent a lot of smoke into the Portland metro area and everybody was very concerned about it, but that was a huge fire. And if you drive along the gorge and you see all the trails that are closed, it looks very extensive, it looks huge. 
that's actually a small fire that was only 50,000 acres. So relate that to the hundreds of thousands of acres of fire that we regularly have each year. And actually this year, total fires was over a million acres. So that is a large area um, that is getting burned in Oregon. And look at the impact just that small area in the Eagle Creek fire had. Skipped ahead a little too far. Um, so oftentimes when we're thinking about how to manage for wildfire or insect pest risk, we need to do the same thing. So you can basically kill two birds with one stone, that there are a lot of preventative actions. A lot of times there aren't curative actions. Once these things have already happened, there isn't a lot to undo it or mitigate that damage. So we need to be thinking preventatively. And I know that's hard to do. And sometimes it takes money that we don't wanna spend, but we're gonna be in a better spot if we think preventatively. So one of the most important things that we need to pay attention to, attention to is climate change which has yielded in continuous and statewide hot droughts that sharply increased from 2011 on and hit a peak in 2015, and now it's exponentially increasing. And so what we're talking about is not record highs in temperature, or record lows in precipitation. It's more complicated than that. And this is why people are saying that these are droughts that are unprecedented because they are very different from records we've had in the past. It's not just high temperatures, it's high temperatures over long periods of time. And when they are occurring in spring, right when trees are waking up and they're most needy for moisture, it's hot and dry. Or when they're going into dormancy in the fall, it's still dry. Um, that's very stressful for a tree. And our precipitation has become very low and also inconsistent. So we might get a huge dump of snow as we did last winter, but it doesn't stick around. It melts off within a few days or a week. That's not enough time. We need that long winter snow, especially in our mountains to recharge waterways. So it's becoming more inconsistent. We're also seeing um, more catastrophic storms because that inconsistent temperature um, uh, flux has happened where, for example, the heat scorch that I'll get into happened very quickly. So um, take a look at this map. This is from um, October through September in 2021. On the left, it's temperature statewide. And this is an average for that year period. Um, so it's not what happened month to month. So if I were to show you just August, most of the state would be orange or red, which is really, really hot. But this is just an average over the course of a year. So it includes our cooler and warmer or cooler and uh, more moist air, um, time periods. And it kind of mellows it out. But as you can see, most of the state is still orange, which is much above average temperature. To the right, it's precipitation. And again, much of the state is yellow or orange, which is below normal or much below normal. And the red is record driest in the state. So this is a really scary prospect, but this is kind of the new normal that we're looking at. So I really encourage you to um, access the web link that I have below that's shortened so it's easier to remember. So the Oregon Water Resources Department produces a great document that you can subscribe to and get in your email every month that gives you a really nice breakdown with some nice visuals of a summary of where we're out in terms of temperature and precipitation so that we are really aware of what's actually happening out there rather than kind of going by how we feel things are going. Um, it's, it's easy for us to become accustomed to um, a hotter, drier fall, for example, and think that, oh, well, th this year it's a little bit cooler. It's a little bit um, more moist when really we're not where we should have been maybe 10 years ago. So looking at this um, summary email will kind of uh, get you up to speed on where we're really at and there are predictions. So it will predict out, I think the next three weeks, um, what temperature and precipitation is looking like. They average it for the whole state and then they also break it down by region. It's a really, really nice document that's put out every month. It's short, it's easy to read. It's just a nice way to read the first few paragraphs and get up to speed on what's really happening out there. And then you can think of what to expect in terms of how your trees are going to be doing. So there's that 2021 heat wave, which is unprecedented, not just because it broke records, but because it, it happened over a long period and it was very fast. So trees did not have time to acclimate. When we have a building higher temperatures, trees can do certain things that can kind of shut down systems and they can weather the storm. But because it happened so fast, we saw trees being taken by surprise and then scorch at the tips of those trees. 
The highest impact was along forest edges, um, which are just most more exposed to the elements, along roads, and on the south and west facing sides of trees where the sun was hitting it um, most strongly. And in particular, we saw a large amount of damage along the coast and other cooler areas that phenologically develop a little bit later in the season. So the bud break is a little bit later. So it doesn't happen right in the beginning in, in March, for example, like it does in the warmer parts of the state. At the coast, it happened somewhere near June. And that's when we had this heat event. Um, so that's really going to be most damaging when those trees are just waking up. Um, what we saw is that even though it wasn't whole crown scorch, usually we saw it um, more strongly on one side of the tree, a lot of the buds were not harmed. And so we expect that those needles will appear next year or um, the broad leaf leaves will still open and will have bud break as expected, but we really don't know. And it won't be until the start of next spring that we know what the impact on these trees were because they are um, now going into dormancy. We also don't know, we can only see the external manifestation of this heat scorch. We also don't know if there's cavitation or collapse of those vascular tissues that help bring water up through the tree or die back of roots that help collect that water in the first place. So we don't know what's going to happen until next spring, but we do know that growth is definitely going to be reduced in these trees. Defenses are going to be reduced in these trees, but we just don't know about mortality until spring. And the start of spring and into early summer, we'll start seeing some trees that are either the, that are fully red that have actually died from the scorch event. So just to give you a quick and dirty rundown of how drought is affecting trees. So um, when trees are pulling in moisture, it travels up, it's collected by the roots, it travels up those vascular tissues, which act as straws to suck it up and distribute it throughout the canopy of the tree, getting it to the photosynthetic tissues to conduct photosynthesis. Then the water is lost from those leaves into the air more quickly when it's warmer as well. And so what trees will do is because those leaves are reduced, releasing so much moisture, sometimes they will prematurely drop those leaves. Um, because then that's a reduction of those organs that are um, releasing more moisture. And when they drop those leaves, then you have a thin looking canopy. And that is a, a common drought symptom to see just a thinner, less full and lush looking canopy. When you reduce leaves, you're reducing photosynthesis. So then those leaves are not supporting the growth and development of twigs and those twigs die back. Then you have branch loss and you can have an asymmetrical looking crown because it doesn't happen evenly throughout the crown. So you'll see kind of some wonky looking trees out there. Um, internally, you'll see fine root dieback. Those fine roots are really, really essential for bringing in moisture and nutrients. And you'll see that start to die back so that when you have those roots dying back, even the next year, if you get more moisture, there aren't enough roots to bring it in. Um, roots also may migrate in the soil, trying to look for um, water sources within the soil, sometimes going deeper. And when you have it, the roots migrating throughout the soil layer, sometimes if they come to the surface, then they're more prone to compaction, especially if they're growing along streets or driveways um, where there's a lot of vehicle or foot traffic um, traveling over those roots. You could also see vascular tissue collapse. Those are those straws that are pulling the moisture up from the roots and distributing it throughout the tree. And so what happens is that pressure of pulling that moisture um, going from the soil through the roots, through the straws, and then out through the leaves, that pull is so strong when there's not enough moisture below, but the pull from the air is so strong that those tissues will break. And so um, when these tissues are lost, the roots and the vascular tissues, um, it takes a long time and a lot of resources to rebuild them. It takes more than a span of a year. It could take multiple years. That's why sometimes we see trees die from drought damage that happened two, three years in the past because those trees are limping along with the tissues they have and then realizing they just don't have enough to support the tree. Lastly, you may also see an increase in cone crops. It's a fight or flight response that they can't keep growing. They really may not persist on the landscape mortality is imminent. And so then they'll produce more seed um, in the hopes of using those resources for a future benefit. So if you see a thinning crown and a whole bunch of seed um, in maples or conifers, um, that's something to think about that you might be looking at drought stress. So here's some pictures of common drought symptoms. And I will mention that drought happens, um, drought damage happens a little bit more slowly. So you'll see these symptoms slowly start 
over the course of a year, two years, whereas insects move very fast. And you'll see that tree looked fine one year and then the next year it turns completely red. So really pay attention to when your tree looks a little bit different from year to year. Um, if it's a slow progression, any one of these symptoms, you have drought stress, insects don't cause these symptoms. So those are, that's the thinning crown. If you look to the right of that picture just a little bit, you see a more lush Douglas fir, but to the left, it's very thin and, and there's still a lot of seed being put out. So that tree is very drought stressed. Um, in this picture to the right, you see top kill. And then to the immediate left of that rightmost tree, there's a little bit more top dieback that's happening and the trees to the far left are doing just fine, but it's likely to progress that um, it's taking out the weakest trees first. And then that's that asymmetrical crown where the branch loss is uneven throughout the canopy, um, but the tree is just dropping needles and branches to try and retain as much moisture as possible. This can also be a symptom of wind damage. So think about where you're at. If you're seeing this in the gorge, it's usually wind damage or ice damage. And then flagging. So single branches here and there are so drought stressed that they will die and then they will sheave off and look like that asymmetrical crown that I've showed before. So when you're thinking about what trees should be on our landscape, um, just because we have climate change stress on the landscape doesn't mean we can, we're going to see the loss of all of our trees. We just need to shift our perspective in terms of what trees can grow where and always be thinking that whatever trees you are putting into an area, um, try to go for natives, natives that are adapted to that site specifically, not just any natives that are found in the state, ones that will do well at that site. Um, there are some non-natives that are very drought tolerant that might do great in a certain site, but they're going to be at risk of insects that are found there that they're not used to. And so you're just better off going with natives wherever possible. Um, true fir is not a drought tolerant species. So be thinking about that, even if you're thinking of grand fir, which is slightly more drought tolerant, but planting nobles at a low elevation area, such as in Lake Oswego, not a great move unless it's going to be irrigated. Um, Western hemlock also not very drought tolerant. Uh, Western red cedar, as you're seeing, a lot of Western red cedar die back. Uh, and even moving into Douglas fir. Some of the more drought tolerant trees, surprisingly, could be big leaf maple, oak, and pine. So the ones that I have circled here, those are ones that um, are going to be more stressed. So if you have a, an area that is um, getting a lot of sun exposure, a lot of wind exposure, um, doesn't have a lot of moisture access, I would avoid these species opting for others such as incense eater, which is a great drought tolerant native tree that we have. And these core samples I'm showing you here, you can see the reduction in growth due to long term drought stress. That top core sample has nice wide growth rings. Look for those dark bands um, that are nice and wide down below. They're just a lot of um, very packed together short bands because the growing seasons were greatly reduced due to drought. And so I'll give you a perfect example of some of the range reduction that we're seeing where Western, um, some of our species that are even native species are being shifted or aren't doing well in areas that they should be doing well. Um, a prime example is Western red cedar, which I'm sure you are seeing in your area. I know because we have a monitoring project and I have mapped many in the Lake Oswego area that we are seeing struggling in areas where um, they have done well for many, many years. So this is a great example of the climate change impact that we're seeing widely, um, especially in the Portland area where we have these heated city islands. Um, and these Western red cedar are in areas where they historically have thrived, should be thriving, but are not doing well. This includes along streams. And one thing to mention is that even though there's running water or there's a stream in an area, it's less than has historically been there because of climate change. And so it's not how much water is there, it's how much water should be there relative to what that tree is used to. And so in this map, I'm showing um, the historical range of Western red cedar and that red bar is where we're seeing the highest intensity of dieback of Western red cedar. Washington is also mapping this with us. We are also working with um, Canada and Alaska and Idaho mapping some of their damage. So what we're often seeing is the Western red cedar start to die back, especially in marginal sites. This is old agricultural areas that are very sun exposed and very open or rocky sites or um, in sun exposed yards, uh, street trees, Western red cedar is not a good street tree. It's not good for sun exposed yards. And those are the ones that are getting hit first. 
Um, there are no major insects or diseases that attack Western red cedar. There are some insects that can finish off a Western red cedar that is heavily stressed, but they cannot overcome the defenses of a healthy Western red cedar because it has some unique chemical defenses that really protect it. Um, Western red cedar often gets stem rot. That's very common. It's usually attacking heartwood, which is not really providing much in terms of a structural component. So those trees can stay standing for many, many years. Um, it's kind of like cutting off fingernails that or yeah, fingernails that um, they that's not going to damage the body because it's something that is not really lending a lot of support to the body. So that's what's happening with the stem rot. There are no root rots that are really impactful for Western red cedar. So oftentimes, um, you will see stem rot in a Western red cedar and it's still thriving. So that's not contributing to this dieback. So the symptoms that you are um, going to be seeing in the Western red cedar are number one, thinning canopy. So that's a picture to the far left. And sometimes it can be hard to determine that if a tree is thin relative to other trees. So I would look around, look for other Western red cedar and you'll see that some maybe look a little bit more see-through than others. Top kill is another big one. And sometimes we're seeing some yellowing in the trees, but typically it's the thinning or the top kill. When you start seeing that in Western red cedar, start thinking about future planning of what tree can go in there next, because that's likely not going to make it if the damage is really extensive. Um, I've seen trees that look as bad as the thinned and top killed ones in this picture here that will die within the next two to three years. Um, they don't typically die very quickly. Remember, drought stress is slow, and so it'll take a few years, so you have some time for future planning. I often suggest that if you have Western red cedar with these symptoms, replacing with incense cedar is a really nice option. So one of the common um, theories in forest health is um, the Mannion spiral, which is basically just a synergistic effect of multiple stressors. Very rarely is there a silver bullet. Very rarely is there one agent that is stressing a tree and killing it. You can just address that one agent. It's usually a whole pile of factors that um, kind of add on year after year. Now, trees live for many, many years. This isn't a crop like corn that, or a house plant that it gets a little bit stressed one year, but it can bounce back. Um, they are long-lived species that get stressed by multiple things year after year, and that stress adds up. They can rebuild and rebound, but if, they, if that stress doesn't ever let up, then they don't get a chance to rebuild. So uh, hot droughts are a primary example of that, where these trees have just not gotten a break for years. And another theory to be mindful of is that growth is what gets all the resources. Whatever's left over, with those resources goes to defense. So if there aren't enough resources such as moisture, most importantly, to support growth, there isn't enough to support defense. So healthy trees are well-defended trees. They have mechanical and chemical defenses. A great example of this is in conifers that they have that sap. And anytime you see sap being produced in a tree, people often worry when they see a, lot, a large sap flow or a pitch mass. Um, that's actually a really good sign because it shows that tree is sealing itself off. It's got a wound somewhere and it's sealing it to prevent entrance from fungus or other um, stressors. And so when that moisture is available, they can produce that sap. If there isn't enough moisture, they're not producing that sap. And oftentimes it's a mechanical barrier against fungus, as I mentioned, also against um, insects such as bark beetles that will bore in. And that picture to the right, that's a small bark beetle that's caught in the sap. It's a mechanical barrier. And it's also a chemical barrier. There are a lot of components in sap that are repellent or toxic to insects or fungi. So very important for a tree to have enough moisture to produce that sap. And I do also want to highlight that we don't want to disregard the importance of long-term control provided by natural enemies. There are a wealth of predators and parasitoids on our landscape. And the more that we can allow them to be present, the more helpful they'll be. Um, it's very common to see an insect pest and then want to immediately treat it with insecticide. Most of our insecticides are broad spectrum and they can impact these natural enemies you're not thinking of. Um, they're very tiny little wasps that are great parasitoids that can kill these pests that we have in our landscape, but we don't see them because they're so tiny, but they are heavily impacted by pesticide use. Um, so one of the things that we need to be aware of is really reading labels and looking at what kind of um, product we're using if we are going to be using a product 
how broad spectrum is it? Can it, does it have a list of a lot of different types of insects that it impacts? If so, you might wanna think of a different option. Um, also providing refugia is really important. These uh, beneficial natural enemies really need areas to live and thrive. So maybe don't sanitize the site, don't remove um, what you might view as a few weeds here and there. If they're native and not invasive, you might just wanna let this little patch of grass or this little patch of dandelions go because it's actually an area where some of these natural enemies can reside. So as I've mentioned, there are a lot of things that can set the stage to stress trees and then allow insects to come in. And so I, I heavily covered hot droughts, that's a big one, wildfire, storm damage, anything that's damaging the tree, it's reducing its ability to defend itself. The lack of natural controls due to invasive species that come in and there we don't have native predators that are going after them. Pesticide drift um, impacting those natural enemies or even mild winters as we saw Spruce aphid was attacking Sitka spruce um, a couple years ago along the north coast in particular. We saw these browning spruce, that's spruce aphid, a non-native insect that's been established here for decades, but because we had really mild winter, it didn't knock their populations back. And then some insects just have cyclical biology where they just after, you know, every five to 10 years, they might um, have an increase in their populations. And what's typical with those scenarios is that the populations will crash on their own. And we typically don't need to worry about them. We just kind of need to hang in there for a year or two. So here are some general management tips that are really important to keep in mind for um, addressing any sort of damage, whether it's wildfire, climate change, insects, diseases. Number one is I keep saying, plant the right species and cultivar in the right place really be aware of what are the requirements of this type of tree and planting it appropriately, giving it the best chance for success. Always opt for site appropriate natives, um, even though there are non-natives that might do well in a site, be thinking that there are a lot of different components that could stress them that wouldn't stress a native variety. Um, provide adequate spacing and reduce competition, especially from invasive plants, grasses, et cetera. Give those trees as much room as possible to collect enough moisture and no competition from other species that might be collecting that or stealing that moisture from them. Plan for climate change, especially on marginal sites by maybe increasing that spacing a little bit more or opting for species that do really well on drier sites. And if you are going to irrigate, irrigate consistently, long, deep soaks. The analogy I like to use is that as a human, we cannot drink all the water we need on Monday and then call it good for the rest of the week. Neither can trees. They need a long, deep soak. Um, sprinklers are not going to do it. That, that works for grass. It does not work for really tall trees. So if you are going to irrigate, really look into how much moisture is going to be needed for a really large tree. Sometimes you just need to do one really heavy soak um, maybe once a month if, if we have a very hot summer. But remember, if you're doing that, it needs to be consistent. So if you do it one month and you don't do it the next month, you're going to send that tree right back into drought stress. Probably more important than irrigation, because most of us cannot irrigate that much, is avoiding fertilization. Because fertilization increases growth, therefore increases water requirements. And um, if you have a tree that's starting to turn yellow, fertilizing is not going to help it. Typically, there's something else stressing that tree. Um, remove struggling trees um, because those are just stealing water from your healthier trees that can um, stay on that site. And then preventing mechanical damage from construction and roads, really being mindful that this is a tree with a large root system right under where that equipment is moving over. So being very mindful, sometimes setting up a gate as a buffer at a distance away from that tree is really helpful. Um, a lot of construction firms do that, but sometimes the gate is a little too close in that a drip line of the tree. It needs to be a little further out. Um, you can remove current infestations if you actually do have an insect infestation, for example, but it's really hard to stay ahead of it. Um, and there are other pests that will keep coming in from adjacent areas because what's happening is that tree is stressed and it's telling those insects to come on in. And so um, they're going to still be there on site. A lot of what we call pests are actually native and present on the landscape widely. And then, as I mentioned, encourage natural enemies where at all possible. That is our best form of long-term pest control. 
So I'm not gonna get into too many insect issues here. There are too many to number, but really we only have a handful that are pests and I'll talk about some of those situations, but bark beetles are the ones that I get the most calls about. Um, they are very tiny, as you can see in this picture, the head of a matchstick, they're very small, but they can be eruptive and they're opportunistic. They're very, very good at detecting when trees are stressed and they will go to those trees and then they will send out attractive pheromones to other members of their species to bring them in. And when you have that power in numbers, you can overcome the tree's defenses only if it's a bit stressed. And then they build and build, and then they send out a repellent pheromone that says no more vacancy. We don't have enough resources for you. And they um, can actually keep their populations the way they are rather than kind of eating themselves out of house and home. What these insects do is they don't get into the wood they just get right under the bark and they are girdling the tree by cutting back and forth along those vascular tissues. Those are those straws that bring in moisture and they're creating their populations in those galleries. They also can vector fungus that can clog those vascular tissues, therefore hastening tree death. And these insects can move very quickly. So as I mentioned, drought symptoms typically occur over a year, two, three years, but bark beetles, once they move in en masse, um, they can kill a tree within a year, and that's quite typical. And all of the bark beetle pests that we contend with are native, and they're present on the landscape widely. It's just when you have a glut of stressed trees that they can build up. And as I mentioned, they can detect uh, stressed trees quite easily. And when that tree is stressed, especially moisture stress, it has reduced sap, and sap is the main barrier to prevent bark beetle entry. Here are some signs and symptoms of typical bark beetles. So you might see thin pitch streams, not a large pitch mass, just a thin pitch stream or little plugs or um, little tiny masses. They're called pitch tubes and that's typically on pine. That's when a beetle is burrowing in and the tree is trying to push it out with sap. So that's an indication. If you see brown frass, it's a sawdust like material because they're chewing their way through that bark and it's only gonna be brown, not white because they're not getting into the wood. They kick out that brown frass. That is a prime indication that bark beetles are in, in a tree. If you have a pile of frass here and there, maybe one or two on a tree trunk, that's no cause for concern. As I mentioned, these bark beetles are native, widely present on the landscape. They should be there. And the one or two here or there are not going to kill a tree. But if you have a mass of them, such as in this picture where just in this small section of log, you see multiple piles of frass. That is something that is more concerning. If you were to peel back the bark, you would see these galleries are actually quite beautiful. And each bark beetle species makes a very specific pattern and they'll make that same blueprint pattern over and over again. Once the beetles leave the tree, then you see the holes. You don't see entrance holes, just exit holes. They're perfectly round. Um, this is an approximation of the size of most bark beetles, that they are about the diameter of a grain of rice, and you'll see a whole bunch in one area, and that indicates an outbreak. And then you may see fungus, fungal stains, but I wouldn't rely on that as much because there are many different fungal stains that um, some are um, actually going to indicate bark beetles and some are not. Um, this is just one example where it grows in rays across the rings. And then you'll see a red crown and that occurs within the first year. Sometimes the first top third dies immediately. Um, it's not a slow progression. It's immediately that top third is red and then the rest of the tree will turn red sometimes within the same season. So the process is that the beetles get into the trees, they kick out that sawdust, you'll see the sawdust, you may see some pitching. And then if you peel the bark back, you'll see the galleries they're creating and the fungus that they're vectoring. And then once they have left, you'll see those exit holes in the trees. When the tree is red, usually they've been long gone and they will not come back and keep hitting that tree. Bark beetles like a tree that's still living, albeit stressed, still living because they need that moisture. Wood borers are the other very common group of insects that I get a lot of calls about that are attacking our trees. Um, they are typically secondary, meaning they are only moving into trees that are heavily stressed, already dead or dying because they're the first um, uh, agents of decomposition and they get into the wood. So you'll see a white frass instead of red frass. And typically they're a lot larger. So you'll see really large exit holes. And again, they're perfectly round or oval um, because it's just like you took a drill and put it through the tree versus a woodpecker hole that's kind of sloppy around the edges. So this is some example of some wood boring beetles. I get the most calls about these because they look really big or flashy and a large insect must be killing a tree, right? But typically it's, it's the really tiny ones that we worry about. 
So I'm gonna run through very quickly with my remaining time here, some of the common issues that I see, particularly in the Lake Oswego area, um, to get you thinking about what trees you have on your landscape and what should be there. Most commonly, I see rows of Western red cedar. We like to plant what we call arborvita, um, which is Western red cedar. It's just a different cultivar that we term arborvita and um, they have additional names for different cultivars. But we plant these as fence rows. And oftentimes they're in fence rows because they're in a nice big sun exposed yard. That is not what Western red cedar likes. They prefer shade and moisture. And so oftentimes you'll start to see that fence row fail where one tree will turn red, then maybe the next tree and the next tree. And I get calls about their insects killing my trees and that's not correct. It's a hot drought that's killing the tree because of the conditions that we have or just because it's being planted in an area that that species does not like over the long term. Once it's stressed by that drought, then these beetles can come in and finish the tree off. Whereas if those trees were healthy, they could not kill those trees. So be thinking about, if you're thinking about planting arborvita, put them in an area that's not as sun exposed or opt for a different species. Um, next, grand fir I'm seeing fail in a lot of areas, even though grand fir is a true fir, which is not drought tolerant, grand fir can live in lower elevations where it's a little bit warmer, a little bit drier, but they still don't like it as much as maybe a dug fir would. Um, and they, it's not sustainable to have these really large grand fir, especially when we have climate change increasing the temperatures and droughts um, over the long term. So I often see these larger grand fir that are kind of spotted here and there amongst dug fir that are dying. You'll see that top kill and then the whole tree then turns red. Oftentimes the bark will slough off because the woodpeckers are working away at the bark beetles. And once that bark sloughs off, you'll see all these um, horizontal lines, these cuts, those are the galleries for fur engraver. It's a beetle that's finishing off those drought stress trees. Next, I often see birch, again, planted in sun exposed yards. Birch are, birch are very beautiful trees and often will have one statement tree, um, but they like cool, moist conditions. And so um, a beetle will come in and finish off a tree that's drought stress. Oftentimes you'll see top kill. So the top part of the tree, the leaves will start dying back. And then the next year, more of that top will die back, more of that top will die back. The leaves still come back each year, but fewer and fewer um, starting from the top down. Um, I would, if you're going to retain birch, in your, or birch on your property, I would opt for native uh, paper or water birch. Um, those will do the best in terms of, of adapting to our changing conditions. Planting them in clusters is helpful. They can shade each other out and absolutely adding mulch to the base so they can retain as much moisture as possible. Once you get to a critical mass, um, these trees will not persist. In this picture, you can see there's just a little bit of top bite dieback starting in these trees. There are systemic pesticides that arborists can employ to um, knock out the insects that are hitting those trees but it's just a Band-Aid. You will likely have to do it every one to two years. It's very expensive. I would start thinking about future planning, maybe putting in other trees right around those birch to give them a bit more shade if, if they're not too far gone. Um, Douglas fir, even though it's only a moderately drought tolerant tree, we are in very droughted times. And so be thinking about where you're placing Douglas fir. Um, again, place it with some other trees around it. Uh, the cemetery had a very nice big sun exposed area and this dug floor was really struggling. That's drought stress with that asymmetrical crown. Avoid rocky soils, sun exposed or edge habitat. This is not a great street tree, for example. Um, and then there are beetles that can get into these trees, especially if there's blow down damage. Um, there is a repellent MCH that works very well that keeps the beetles out of the tree. If you wanna learn more about that, you can contact me or look at our forest health website. And that's that product. You just staple it onto the tree. Um, I think this is the last one about the um, common issues and pine is a big one. I often see Scots and Mugo pine planted ornamentally. Um, it's not native, doesn't do great here. It can for a time, but it does tend to struggle, especially if it's drought, drought stressed, even though it is a pine. And oftentimes if you have cut some limbs off, you might see these large pitch masses from this insect called sequoia pitch moth, which does not actually kill the tree. It's just an aesthetic pest. And these pitch masses will occur year after year. And it's kind of unsightly, but the tree will persist. 
more pressing, there's a bark beetle called Ips that will get into the tree and you know your pine is struggling if you see the top third starting to turn red. Um, the last topic I'll touch on today is bees in our forests and in our urban trees. So uh, trees actually provide uh, often overlooked habitat for our native bees. We have many, many bees in the Pacific Northwest, and there are a lot of forage plants and bare soil and um, uh, nesting materials for these bees because they often will nest in the ground or in debris such as stumps or any woody material where they can um, carve out some cavities. We have over 600 species of bees in Oregon alone, and this is a smattering of pictures that we've collected across the state of our native bees. Um, some are very beautiful, very eye-catching, and there's a lot of variety out there. And we have so much forest habitat, almost half of our acreage in Oregon is forested, and this is great habitat for bees and great corridors for bees to travel. And this includes in our urban areas. So there are a lot of different plants that do provide the nectar sources that these bees require. Most of our trees are conifers and wind pollinated and do not require bees. Bees will still visit them for resins for their nests occasionally. Um, maples are a huge beneficial poll um, pollen provider um, and nectar provider because they are an early season flowering tree. And if you pay attention to this coming spring, when you start seeing your vine maples starting to break bud and, and then the flowers will start coming out, um, you'll, you will definitely see bees. If you just stick around and look at a tree for a few minutes, you'll see some bees visiting those flowers, a very important early season nectar source. And as I mentioned, most of our bees nest in the ground or in cavities. That's something we don't think of. We always think about honeybees, which are not native and they are housed in these um, hives that we actually manage for. These bees are typically free living. They live singly. They don't have a large colony and they will just make little holes in the ground. Um, oftentimes we look at them and think they're flies, but they're actually bees and they're just widely present on our landscape. Ways that you can enhance habitat for these bees are to group plants with similar flower shapes to provide a strong signal because a bee will like to work the same type of flower and just visit the next and next and next. And then um, creating a large swath of plants um, that they can feed from rather than just scattering seed widely, just make the one stop shopping for them. Planting native flowering plants with a long flowering window, we want something flowering spring through summer. And then planting these plants in areas where maybe forgotten areas along fences in the back corner of our yard, wherever we can plug in pollinator plants, that's gonna be useful for them leaving some areas with exposed soil for ground nesters, um, leaving some nesting materials such as pithy stems, and then removing aggressive or invasive plants that outcompete or reduce uh, native forage plant diversity. Here are some ways that you can get involved with some things that are going on in your community. That's the drought damage survey, looking at where you see drought damage on your landscape. You can report it at this website. And then joining the Oregon Bee Atlas, um, mapping and monitoring some of our native bees that are present on our landscape. And the last resources I'll give you is our Forest Health page um, that we have a lot of informational fact sheets and contacts for our staff if you want to, if you have questions for us. And there are many foresters also statewide that can provide um, help for if you have a larger stand of trees. And with that, um, I will open it up for questions if we have time and I'll send it over to Allie. Yeah, thank you so much, Christine. That's a lot of helpful information to unpack. So we will be having a five minute Q&A. I know that's not a lot of time, but you can post in the chat your questions and we will consolidate all the unanswered questions and um, answer them in post event communications. So yes, you can post your questions in the chat or you can raise your hand and um, I'll call on you. Yeah, and any, any questions that are in the chat, I will be monitoring and answering those during this meeting. So if you have not put a question in the chat, please do raise your hand and um, I'll answer it now verbally. I see Cheryl. Cheryl, you're on mute. <laughs> the incense cedar, you mentioned incense cedar as being um, a pretty good tree to grow here. Uh, when you put plant an incense cedar, can they be planted just like a single tree or do they have to be planted in a in a group of trees and do they and do they uh, uh, hold up under the sun or do they yes. have to have shade? Yes, so incense cedar likes sun and they can be planted singly. They do great in a sun exposed lot. But remember, incense, as with any other tree, 
give it enough water the first and second years. Um, when they are youngest, they're just like children. They are the most susceptible to damage. And so you want to make sure they're heavily protected, especially when, when we have these hot droughts. So give them enough moisture the first and second years. Once they're established, they'll do great. Thank you. Yeah. From the chat, um, Nancy asks, how harmful is the use of Roundup in our public parks? Um, that's a larger question that I'm not going to answer here. There's a lot of information online. Um, it depends on what is it impacting. Now, there are some impacts um, of Roundup on a lot of different uh, plant communities, but also some insect communities, even though it is not an insecticide, the main impact is that it's reducing uh, vegetation that those insects are relying on. So it's a secondary impact, but that is a larger conversation that would take up the rest of your meeting today. <laughs> Um, with the emerald ash borer approaching Oregon, is it wise to plant Oregon ash? That's a very good question. So we are still saying, yes, please do still plant Oregon ash, maybe a smaller component. Don't um, put all your eggs in one basket. If you have a restoration project, for example, don't plant solely Oregon ash. We have not detected emerald ash borer in Oregon as of yet. We are still looking for it. It's made it as far west that we have found in Colorado. We think it's a matter of time for it to get here. We do not have methods to eradicate it. So once it's here, it's here. We are working on other efforts to uh, determine if we can um, develop resistant varieties of ash that we can start to outplant, um, but that's going to take many years. So I would say don't, don't avoid planting it, but maybe plant some other trees as well other species as well. Um, a question I got from a community member earlier today, how do we balance prudent tree watering and drought with water conservation? That's a very good question. And that's something you would have to figure out singly on what is the um, benefit of the trees that you are trying to protect. If they are native trees that should be on the landscape, I would say irrigation is very important. Um, or be thinking of what species could go in there that would require less moisture. Um, if you are watering things such as grass, I would say let that grass go. How drought resistant are sequoias? Sequoias are relatively drought resistant. Um, in the first few years, like any other tree, they need a lot of watering to get established. But once they are established, they do pretty well. Um, with that being said, sequoias are found um, in Northern California, which is a different habitat from ours, even though we do see a lot of sequoias here. Um, we, those are usually really large trees that were planted hundreds of years ago that the conditions were widely different than they are now. So I would be very careful trying to get them strongly established. Once they're established, they could probably do well for many years. Um, they, they are a little bit drier preferring than the, um, their related, their cousins, the coastal red cedar or uh, redwood. Do invasive plants such as ivy harm the soil health? Um, I don't know about soil health, um, but ivy harms everything. I would say pull out ivy everywhere. Do invasive plant, or sorry, with the climate changing, are there natives that we think will no longer be viable in the nearest term? Yes, unfortunately, so Western red cedar is one. I don't think widely, it won't be viable, though there will still be moist areas that it can do well in our state, but its range will be greatly reduced. Um, and there are a lot of other species we've got our eye on, a lot of our true fur, for example, um, that we need to be mindful of. So like I said, we'll always have trees, but we need to shift our perspective in terms of what trees we'll expect to see where. Are alders particularly susceptible to drought? Yes, they are. So we have uh, red and white alders. White alders are found in our eastern part of the state in central Oregon, and they tend to do a little bit better in drier areas. Um, but on the west side, especially in the Willamette Valley and along the coast, we have red alder, which likes cool and moist conditions. It's not a long live tree either. Um, it only lives, I think it maxes out at about 60 years, I believe. Um, so it's not something that's long term on the landscape um, and often alder is planted underneath the canopy of other trees. It doesn't like a lot of sunlight exposure. Cedars with top dieback, uh, should they be removed and replanted? You know, it depends on the area that it's in. If it's in within striking distance of a structure, you might want to think about removal sooner rather than later. But even though they have top kill, they likely will not fall over for quite some time, even if they have stem rot. With that being said, 
to cover myself. Anything could happen in a strong windstorm. But um, if it were my tree, I would let it stand, see if it could ride it through. But if that top kill extends to um, typically the rule of thumb, if it's 50% uh, or more top kill, it's probably not going to make it. And you should think about removal and replacement. Does air pollution from gas powered lawn equipment and blowers affect trees? Um, directly, it could right at the point source, but more so it's the collective damage that we're all doing by all running this equipment um, in terms of global warming and climate change. And so be very mindful about what equipment you're using, how necessary is it, um, but realizing that's kind of a drop in the ocean, we would all have to get on board with um, being more responsible. Okay, we've got time for one more question. Uh, what will happen to Sitka spruce? Um, Sitka spruce grows mainly in coastal areas where it's more moist and it gets that nice dew. And we, you know, we're probably not in all of our lifetimes on this call here today. We're going to still see Sitka spruce along the coast, but um, it might dwindle, especially um, in the drier areas of the coast. Um, it definitely is one of the more drought susceptible trees. Great, thank you everyone for um, posting questions in the chat. We will consolidate all of the unanswered questions and uh, we are gonna transition to our second breakout. All right, everyone, as you're making, everyone's making their way back. Uh, and then after this, Scott, I will turn it over to you to introduce the city, light our presentation. Okay, welcome back everyone. Um, so now we'll do our whole group share out. Um, who would like to start? We'll try to make it through all of our groups in five minutes. So it's gonna be a little rapid fire. Um, I'll start. Thank you, Betsy. Okay, sure. Be mindful of species that are most likely to thrive when one is uh, introducing new plants in an environment. Um, get active in one's church. Um, uh, and uh, the, the, uh, the uh, green team at the United Church of Christ is doing some excellent work monitoring uh, the carbon in soil. Um, and so use existing social infrastructures like one's church and it is a great way uh, to, 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 and then um, the third is uh, ban gas uh, powered lawn equipment, especially gas powered leaf blowers. Room number hey. six. Um, sure. We talked about irrigation, somebody had a, a a, an implement, a tool that they use called deep root tree water, which basically, you know, you put it in and it diffuses and diffuses kind of down under the ground. Um, so we mostly talked about if we've got a healthy tree that it is important to irrigate. Thank you. Uh, room, yeah, room 10. Uh, we talked about uh, one thing that we learned was that uh, insecticides can actually impact the, uh, the good uh, insects to keep uh, uh, infestations down, um, that uh, the selection of uh, drought resistant trees is important, and um, that we should be uh, mindful of uh, uh, wildfire danger and try to figure out the most ecologically friendly way of, uh, of quote unquote, thinning or uh, taking care of our forests, because uh, we know now that we can't just leave them alone um, on the other hand, we can't go and clear cut them. So what do we do? Um, number uh, room 12. And what we really uh, honed in on was public education, making sure that there's a lot of this information is available to uh, a really wide 
a group of people getting involved in the friends groups, um, basically making sure that our new neighbors have uh, access to this as well as they're moving in and um, are then starting to be aware of some of the things that we need to be concerned about, so. In room, room eight, we talked about the collective dialogue necessary to see where in our city on public and private lands we can replant native trees that are resilient that Christina in her excellent presentation uh, afforded us. In our room, we talked about uh, just being mindful of the tree health and looking around when we're hiking or when we're in the neighborhoods to see um, how they're doing. And we also talked about, uh, someone in our group talked about keeping a tree that they had thought about maybe removing at some point, a maple, but uh, to keep it. Linda? Mute. Can you unmute? There we go. I, I can- Thank you. Record. Oh, sorry, Monica. Uh, do you mind if I go ahead? I, I'm Linda okay. and uh, in our group, we talked about in, whether or not there's an inventory of trees, big trees in particular, because of, I've been concerned about, well, I've been surveying the largest Douglas firs I can find just to keep some kind of documentation. And then also uh, I, I talked about focusing on Western red cedars since they are the ones that are going to be leaving us. I'm curious, where are they? How can we keep them? Um, and what can we do to preserve them? And finally, Anne and I talked a little bit about the removal of trees that are struggling as our, our speakers said. And, you know, I've had the experience where I've seen, um, gave feedback about a permit for removal that's the owner says, well, this is a dying tree. And the arborist turns out to say, no, it's fine. So we were suggesting that maybe we should if you're thinking about removing tree, get professional assessments. Get professionals really know if it's really ill. Ill, and I've had the experience where a tree looked very ill, but just needed some extra help given the drought situation in Oregon. So thank thanks, you, Allie. Monica. Thank you, uh, Monica. We had an amazing discussion. Um, we. Uh, Charles is from Silverton and Silverton just got um, tree city status and citizens push city council to do this. And of course they're looking at, at everything sustainability wise, but they're looking um, to recreate some of the things we've done here. I think it'd be wonderful to work with them. We also had Philip who is, and I've never heard of this, an environmental realtor it's such an amazing idea. Mm -hmm. How do you help um, people who are purchasing a property, I, if, if I understood him correctly, um, to steward their property going, going forward? And, and Philip can, can correct me if I got that wrong, but just um, two, two things, just it was an amazing discussion. <laughs> I wish the breakout rooms were recorded. Um, thank you, Monica. Um, Stephanie? Yeah, um, I think one thing that we had is that uh, we really need, even though it's not as much fun as planting things, is actually getting rid of those invasives that are competing and, and thinking about how we do that throughout our city. So as you walk up, go along, you, there are plenty of places that we need to get rid of ivy, right? So, yeah. <laughs> All right, um, I wanna get to the rest of the groups, but we need to transition over to our LIDAR presentation. Um, for the groups that didn't get a chance to go, can you post your discussion in the chat, please? Um, thank you very much, I appreciate it. And uh, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Scott who will introduce the LIDAR presentation, thank you. Hey, thanks a lot, Allie, and good morning, everyone. I, I just, my name is Scott Siegel, I'm the city's community development director, and I wanted to thank Allie and the summit organizers for inviting uh, the city to present on, on canopy cover. This is something that we've been tracking um, at least since 2006 and the technology has changed quite a bit. Um, I'm here to introduce our speaker. His name is Chad Tinsley. Um, he's been consulting with the city. Uh, he can uh, say a bit about himself, but uh, we've retained his firm to help us with a number of things that involve uh, looking at tree canopy, the city, 
uses the information for our stormwater management program, for our urban and community forestry program, of course, and in assisting um, in, our, in our partnerships with the watershed councils and friends groups as we undertake um, enhancement projects. So uh, with that, I'll hand it over to Chad and uh, thanks again for including us. Thank you for the intro, Scott. Um, hopefully everyone's seeing the right screen here and can hear me. Can I get at least one thumbs up if so, just so I can. Looks good. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Um, so I'm gonna run through this. My presentation is done um, on what's called a story map. So my background is as a GIS analyst and remote sensing specialist. So we're gonna be talking about um, how we model canopy change. So I'm gonna discuss um, how we create the canopy height model in GIS and then talk about um, some tree canopy change assessments that we've done. So uh, as Scott mentioned, we've been modeling the tree canopy for, for quite a few years now, going back to 2006. Starting in 2009, we started using LIDAR and aerial imagery, which, um, which I'll explain in more uh, detail coming up. But uh, the canopy height model is, is a map layer that represents uh, tree canopy location and height. And it's used by the city for, for, for different permitting needs and planning purposes, but it also is used um, to track canopy growth. Um, and uh, by, by, by doing this, the city can implement different strategies to, to promote the urban tree canopy and the numerous benefits uh, it provides. We've heard a lot about that in other talks. Um, some of those are, are highlighted here in this graphic as well. Um, so first part of the discussion will be talking about how we create this tree canopy height model, what the tree canopy height model is. Um, so this is sort of just a graphic on how it's done and then I'll get into detail, but um, we combine uh, aerial imagery and what's called the LIDAR point cloud, which I'll describe and combine those in GIS to extract the tree canopy height model. Um, so this is uh, just an example look of the aerial imagery sort of near downtown um, and over to the golf course. So on the left here is what we're used to seeing. So this is the natural imagery made up of red, green, and blue bands. And then on the right, as I scan across is um, false color imagery that's uh, created using a near infrared band. So as you can see, the vegetated areas are really jumping out in red here and are really, it's, it's a great um, image for distinguishing uh, vegetation from impervious surfaces. You can also take that near infrared band along with the red visible band and create the image on the right here uh, which is called a Normalized Digital Vegetation Index, or NDVI. So it is actually a quantitative measure of vegetation health. So values that are closer to negative one showing up as more red here are typically going to be more impervious surfaces, streets, buildings, that sort of thing. And then the vegetated areas um, trending towards green here um, are going to be our, our healthier vegetation areas. It's cool with something like this because you can even, um, you know, with, with, the, with the color imagery, you're not going to be able to tell the difference between, say, a fake turf field versus real grass. And then with this, it'll show up completely differently. Um, so quick discussion here on the LiDAR point cloud. I'm going to sort of zoom in on this image. It's really hard to see. But the LiDAR point cloud is captured from a laser scanner that's attached to the aircraft. So this is flown um, for the metro area every five years now since 2009. So we have 2009, 2014, and then the most recent one has, was done in 2019. So um, citywide, the point cloud is made up of over 2 billion points. Um, these are all attributed with a classification that the LiDAR provider does. Um, typically, they'll just distinguish ground points from other points. That ground points is what allows us to create um, a digital terrain model, um, which is what we use for creating things like um, contour lines. Um, so that's paired with the elevation data. Um, and then we have classifications on return intensity. So that's going to distinguish the hardness of the surface return number is important. So as the um, laser scanner shoots down pulses, it'll 
continue through the canopy and it will record um, which return it is. So the first returns are gonna be tops of buildings, tops of the trees. So if you imagine we can create a surface from those first hits, subtract the elevation from the surface from the ground hits, and that is gonna give us the height of everything. Um, so we have the heights of buildings and canopy and overhead the wires citywide. And then the last image here are the aerial um, colors that are attributed to the lighter point cloud. And that's just a great way to visualize things and create um, 3D models. So on the right here is the model that I was describing where we've taken the first hits from the LIDAR scan and data surface and subtracted that from the terrain hits. So we now have the height of, of, of everything and I filtered those. So the red areas represent all heights over 10 feet. So 10 feet is the minimum height we use for the tree canopy model. That's where we see a lot of um, benefit from trees once they've reached that um, more mature height. So on the left here, again, we've got our NDVI showing vegetated areas. And then in red here on the right are tall areas. So by taking the areas where those overlap, we're able to finally <laughs> extract um, our tree canopy height model. So scanning back this over the aerial here, um, we can see we have a citywide model now. Um, the lighter green represents taller trees and the darker greens are lower trees. So someone in this last talk was just asking, okay, where are the, where are the biggest trees at in the city? I could easily uh, say, okay, just show me where trees are over 200, and 200 feet tall and those images would pop out. So we could easily provide that info. It's not gonna tell us how wide it is, but we could definitely easily indicate the um, tallest trees throughout the city using this canopy height model. So what do we do with this information? Um, so I created the canopy height models for from 2014 data as well as 2019 data so that we could do a canopy change assessment. Um, so here's what that canopy change model looks like on the right. And I'm gonna zoom in just to sort of describe this a bit. Um, these kind of duller green areas are where our 2014 canopy height model and our 2019 uh, canopy overlap. The brighter greens here are all new areas in the canopy. So around all the tree groves, we're starting to see that outward canopy growth. Um, and then we're also seeing areas like this where it's either new, new trees or trees that were previously immature under 10 feet that have now since 2014 um, reached that 10 feet height that are now being included. These orangish areas are all indicative of um, tree loss. So that can occur from hazard tree removal. It could be weather related loss um, or it could be permitted or unpermitted removal on either residential areas or through uh, commercial development. Um, as I sort of pan around the city here, you can see uh, a pretty consistent um, trend we have. We have this horizontal canopy growth really along all of the tree groves. And then we have pockets of trees that have uh, been removed for a, from um, any number of purposes. And then we have a few pockets of larger areas where um, new housing has gone in or there has been some um, different developments occurring. And then obviously um, areas, I can just zoom in one more time here, where we've got those trees that now reach that 10 foot height. So we took that canopy change model and we started to say, okay, what, what, what is our canopy change citywide broken out into some different things? So just looking citywide um, and within the urban, serve, the, the urban services boundary, uh, this is the 2019 canopy. Between 2014 and 2019, we saw an increase of 391 acres citywide. So we went from um, under 4,000 to now um, at 4,277 acres. 
Um, this is also an important chart. We went from um, this green bar represents the acreage in 2014 and this lighter green is 2019. And in this pie chart, uh, this 46% represents the percent canopy or the percent canopy coverage in 2014. And then in 2019, we're up to 51%. So an overall increase of, of 5% in our overall canopy coverage, um, despite knowing that development and hazard tree loss has definitely occurred. We also broke this out into our neighborhoods. So this first look is at percent canopy cover um, within the neighborhoods. So on the map, the darker green areas um, represent higher percent canopy cover. This is pretty obvious of where we're seeing um, higher canopy cover percent, obviously, um, where there's a lot of uh, dense, dense park areas where canopy is uh, protected. We're seeing um, pretty dense canopy. Uh, and then here's a chart of all the different neighborhoods um, from the um, lowest percent canopy cover to the highest. We also looked at uh, what I think is more interesting is percent canopy increase from 2014 to 2019. So just watch as this map um, changes as I scroll down. So now we're looking at percent canopy increase. So a lot of those areas that have the, the, the highest percent canopy cover didn't show as much change um, from 2014 to 2019 because they're already fairly grown out. Um, some of the areas that had a pretty low percent canopy cover have experienced really high change and that is largely a product of um, people planting uh, in those areas. Um, also a lot of uh, younger street adjacent trees that are now um, above 10 feet and they're providing a lot of um, benefits that street trees do provide. Um, so the great thing that we saw is that we had a, an, an increase in percent canopy in every single neighborhood, um, as low as 2%, all the way up to 26% uh, in the foothills um, neighborhood. So where we had um, a lot of uh, development is where we are seeing the largest increases, which is really positive. We also broke out canopy cover by watershed. So this is a great indicator of um, overall environmental health. So we like to track this also um, in a great indicator of stream health. Um, and again, we saw uh, an, an increase in the acreage of canopy in every single watershed within the city. Uh, we looked at street right of way as well. Um, again, street trees are super important. Not only do they look nice, but um, they really help mitigate the urban heat island. Um, we saw an increase of 54 acres within street, uh, within street right of way boundaries um, citywide. Um, that happens from, again, two different scenarios. The first highlighted here is this um, horizontal canopy growth. And then again, these trees that are now um, starting to reach more mature heights and are included um, in the model. So this area that I've boxed in here, um, I took a couple screenshots from Google Earth here. So it's the exact same spot and see these little young trees here from 2012. And then we had a 2019 view here. We can see how much those grew in just seven years and the amount of uh, shade that those trees now um, provide as well. Also break out canopy by um, the sensitive lands programs overlay districts. So we have our, uh, our, our resource protection areas that are buffers around all the city's streams and then the resource um, conservation and habitat benefit areas that um, are largely uh, upland areas adjacent to those uh, resource protection areas. Um, these are areas that the city really tries to protect. They are essential for um, the canopy shading our streams. They keep 
water temperatures cool for fish. Um, we saw a canopy coverage increase from 87% across all these areas to 89%. So if we're comparing our citywide canopy cover that we know is right around 50%, it's great to see that in these areas where it's really important, um, where we're up close to 90% now. Um, so this all started with a larger effort that I had worked on with the stormwater group for the city where we're specifically looking at effective stream shade. So we've also used um, tools provided by DEQ in combination with the canopy model to determine effective stream shade. So all of the blue dots along all of the city's stream segments represent areas where we are meeting shade targets that are established by DEQ. Uh, going from purple dots all the way to the red dots are areas where we're getting further away from um, shade targets. What's great is that we have this map now and when we need to look at potential areas to increase stream shade, we can say, let's focus on this area. This is where we're gonna, um, this is where we need to start um, cooling our streams to start seeing some of those um, benefits and also meeting um, permit needs through DEQ. The last area here that we uh, intersected the canopy with are outdoor recreation and conservation areas. So this is a map layer that's put together by um, Portland Metro and uh, breaks out a couple of different types of uh, public sites and, and other open uh, space type areas. Again, across all of these different categories, we saw an increase in canopy acreage, except in the golf courses in the city. And I'm actually going to highlight in um, to Oswego Lake Country Club here. Again, this is that same change model. So all these kind of orangish areas are where we had trees in 2014 that are no longer there in 2019. So this shows um, there were a lot of trees that were in poor condition or they were assessed as hazards and removed um, sometime between 2014 and 2019. Um, I do like to pan down here and also look at the public course down here, Lake Oswego Golf Course, almost no tree removal um, on that course. And we did see a net gain in uh, percent canopy within that course. We also like to focus in on our parks, of course. Um, we saw a total increase of 14 acres across the city and park. So that's largely due to a lot of um, efforts by the city and other groups that have um, preserved the canopy that's there and also tried to add to that through um, a lot of different efforts. So that is pretty much the end for me. Um, what we're going to do with this next, what it all means is um, we're going to be updating the, the state of the urban forest report that was last done in 2009. So we're going to get to look back not only at 2014 to 2019 change, but see how things have changed across the city since 2009 um, using this canopy height model. So I've also provided a link here. And this is a, uh, a web map that I can provide the uh, the URL to, so people can explore this as they want. They can pan around and all that. The fun interactive maps as they please. So I'll stop sharing and throw it back to Allie. Hey, thank you so much, Chad. Uh, that was so captivating. I forgot to keep an eye on the time. Um, so um, we are not gonna have a third breakout group but you're, um, you wanna hear your initial thoughts of this presentation. And uh, it looks like the slides will be available on the city website. Um, Scott dropped a link in the chat. Um, so uh, feel free to post your thoughts and questions in the chat and we will consolidate those. Um, as far as next steps um, from this tree summit goes, um, we will be sending notes out in um, November sometime and um, check out our YouTube for the recording, um, watch our website email for opportunities, um, be thinking about the tree summit for next year, 2022, and what we can accomplish between now and then. Um, stay engaged with the Watershed Council and LOSN um, and consider donating or volunteering. 
Um, thank you so much for attending this tree summit and par participating in the conversations. And uh, thank you for joining in. Um, special thank you to the city. And um, yeah, uh, I hope you got some useful information from this summit. And um, yeah, <laughs> thanks everyone.